Okay, hello there everyone and welcome to today's District Administration Web Seminar. It's great to have you all with us. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Kurt Isley Durley. I'm the Web Seminar Editor DA and I'll be your moderator. The title of our webinar, as you see here, is The Power of Instructional Routines. It's being brought to you through the generous support of our sponsor for today, McGraw-Hill. Before we get started, as uh, members of our audience are still coming in here, a bit of background about our topic for today. Routines are crucial to effective mathematics instruction by providing students with structure and helping them understand what to expect, supporting classroom management, and guiding students toward common learning goals. Today we'll be learning more about instructional routines and how to help elementary school teachers to develop instructional routines in their classrooms that can enrich and focus mathematics teaching and learning. We're looking forward to an interesting presentation and discussion here, plus live Q&A. We welcome your questions, so do stay tuned. We're going to get started in just a minute or two. First off, though, just some quick housekeeping. Uh, first item, as it says here, tech support. If you need it at any time, you can use the chat panel at the right side of your screen there. Just select the name of our event host and producer, Jason York. Let him know if you're having any technical issues. He'll be able to help you out there. Also, the uh, second item, as it says here, if you have any audio trouble at any time, we'll also post the phone number and access code that you can use uh, to dial in over the phone. If you need to do that at any time, you can feel free uh, if that's better for you. Also, as I said earlier, we welcome your questions. Uh, and as it says here, if you do have a question at any time, you can enter it in Q&A. You should see that panel at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen there. Just make sure it's set to all panelists, like it says on the slide. And we'll get to uh, as many questions as we can during the Q&A at the end. So uh, once again, if you do have a question for our speaker today, please feel free. Just uh, type it in the Q&A at the uh, bottom right-hand corner. Also, uh, speaking of questions, we are commonly asked about uh, accessing the content of the presentation at a later time, either the, uh, the slides or the recording. And yes, just so everyone knows, everyone who uh, registered or attended here today will be getting a follow-up email with links to the slides as well as the archive recording. We're going to archive this uh, on the DA site and you'll see a link in there right to it. So you'll have ample opportunity to go back over it if you want to review anything, if you want to share with anyone on your team at your district, uh, you'll be able to do that later on. So don't worry about that. We're often asked about that. Uh, and yes, we'll be sending all the content uh, in a follow-up email later on. Okay, so uh, with that, on to our program here. Today we're very fortunate to have with us John San Giovanni, he's mathematics supervisor in the Howard County Public School System there in Maryland. And uh, he's an expert on instructional routines or mathematics. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to him. John, it's great to have you with us. Welcome to our web seminar. Hello, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Well, hello folks. Uh, thanks for taking some time out of your busy day to, uh, to join me and say hello. Um, the irony of this title does not fall short on me. Uh, there's nothing routine about our daily lives at this point. Um, and so uh, I just hope that you and yours are, are safe and well. And um, again, thank you for spending some time uh, with me. Uh, just a note for everyone, uh, my email address is on the screen. We'll have it up for you again at the end. <clears throat> you are always welcome to send a question uh, or anything about uh, anything elementary mathematics related or routine related for that matter. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and get started. The power of instructional routines. Um, how do we harness um, certain frameworks and protocols to, to get the most out of our, our time with students? A um, couple of outcomes for us as, as leaders today, uh, these three are, are my focus, um, helping us identify the value of an instructional routine in elementary mathematics, uh, what they might look like, and more importantly, how we might leverage them. Um, I want to take a few minutes to examine high leverage routines with you for number sense, problem solving, and uh, language acquisition in elementary mathematics. Uh, my experience tells me that those three topics 
again, number sense problem solving and language are, are the heavy hitters when it comes to uh, some of the challenges that we face in, in math instruction today. Um, and then lastly, not only an opportunity for you to ask me questions, but some questions to ask yourself. Um, actions that you may take as, as a leader uh, to advance uh, our teachers' practice um, and, and to support them and to help them um, as they grow as teachers. So uh, the first question I'm going to ask, and it's more of a reflection question for yourself. Uh, you don't have to put anything in the chat box, though you're welcome to do that. Um, I will stop talking for about 20 seconds, which is a miracle in itself. Um, and I'll just ask you to reflect for a moment. How would you describe a routine? In the most general terms, well, how do you describe routine? So I'll give you a moment to think, and then I'll come back in, in less than 20 seconds or so. Okay, just a moment for you to think. If you're playing the recording, you might pause it and continue to write down some ideas. It's a good question maybe to ask our, our staff uh, that we work with in terms of how do they define routines. Often routines might be come in, put your, put your things away, have a seat on the carpet. Um, you know, sometimes we confuse rules with routines, but I really wanna get at the heart of what is, is a routine. Um, first, just maybe to, to set some background um, information about describing routines and, and some of the literature relative to it. Um, so it's a familiar adaptable uh, protocol, as Don put in the chat box, right? Same kind of things, same time, same sequence. Well said. Um, they're familiar for students, um, but, but more importantly, for the math content, they're adaptable, right? Um, and they're designed to engage students um, in learning through thinking and discussion. Um, routines provide structure and flow to an instructional experience. They, they help uh, students have a sense of what's coming next, where we're going with this. I think for teachers, it's a really nice uh, piece of their toolbox. It's not planning for every moment of mathematics because large chunks of them are interchangeable. Um, instructional routines themselves um, support both teaching and, and, and learning in the classroom, right? And that goes again to both sides of the, um, knowing what's happening, how do I plan my time and then um, you know, how do I carry things out? Instructional routines, um, are designed for interaction. And I think that's another piece, right? That math classroom today has to be not just um, engaging, but it has to be a thought-provoking interaction where students are, are authors of ideas. A couple other notes for you about routines. Um, you know, some of the big ideas here is then, again, structure. Um, and we know that students uh, of, of well, all students, each and every student, um, thrives when they know what the expectations are um, and how they are expected to participate um, and that they are that they're safe to participate. Um, they support classroom management and as leaders sometimes much of our work <laughs> is around some of the challenges we face with management and and lastly and I probably would argue most importantly they develop and, and create positive relationships. Um, a well-designed instruction routine opens up the conversation right and so um, today, again, I want to talk with you about three different types of routines. I'm going to start with routines for number sense. Uh, this is where I've done most of my work. Uh, it's the one, it's the topic that I'm probably most passionate about, and that is number sense. Um, so when I talk about a number sense routine, I'm talking about a five to seven minute activity to promote engagement and reasoning and discourse. Um, I want to do a couple of them with you right now. Um, I need you to hear that it, uh, our story in our district was we were losing too much instructional time, hijacking our own instructional time with going over homework and then, you know, doing warm ups that were um, loosely connected to what we needed to get done. We, we were just burning through instructional time and really not getting a lot of juice for the squeeze, so to speak. And, and rituals like calendar math were problematic as well. So frankly, we had to tear, tear that out. We had, to, we had to stop doing those things knowing that kiddos were most focused and most engaged the first seven, 10 minutes of math, we needed to go after number sense. Um, and to be clear, uh, we designed our own and, and researched others and, and, and assimilated those into our program. But no matter what program or tech series you use, um, number routines can uh, 
or can be assimilated really well. I won't spend a lot of time on number sense, but it's a conversation that we have all the time. My kiddos don't have number sense. They're struggling with number sense. And if you ask, you know, 10 different folks about what is number sense, you'll hear a lot of the same ideas, but not necessarily the same idea. So we think about number sense, it's maybe that blue dot in the middle of the screen. It's where all of these things overlap. Mental math, reasoning, magnitude, uh, the ability to decompose numbers, right? And so we knew in, in, in our school district that our elementary math students, and even our middle school math students were, were struggling with number sense. So what we did was, oh, well, we did something about it, to be frank. Um, and it was grounded in this one little notion that it takes about 10,000 hours to get good at something. And, and let's be honest, maybe it's not exactly 10,000 hours, but we would agree that a lot of time is necessary um, to, to, to harness and, and really rehearse and, and um, become good at something. So if you had math for an hour a day for 180 days, you need about 55 years of uh, number sense instruction to, uh, to realize uh, number sense. So maybe that's why some of our adult friends haven't got there just yet. Um, so along those lines, we said, okay, well, what if we did 10 minutes a day for six years, K to five, and then ultimately nine years or so if you went through middle school, but just in six years, if you did 10 minutes a day, right? Um, at the end of that six year sequence, K to five, you would have amassed 180 hours of just intentional number sense practice and play. Um, it reaps the benefits you might suspect. And so what I wanted to do is just share two different number routines with you today before we pivot to problem solving and language acquisition. So you can get a sense of what these might look like. The first example, is, the first example I do with you is gonna be an adult version. <laughs> so keep in mind, this is not a third grade example. Um, unfortunately, we can't turn and talk uh, in this environment. Um, so here's what I want you to do. Um, I'm gonna give you a few moments to think about the prompt. Um, you can put in the chat box some things that you think uh, as I pose them and um, you're free not to as well, okay? But again, just keep in mind that um, this is a think pair share type of protocol, okay? So here we go. The adult version of this routine before I show you the elementary version. About how many people do you think could ride that Ferris wheel at one time? So I'll give you a few moments just to kind of look at that and think about it. Somebody might be thinking, I don't have enough information. That's right. In the world, we don't always have enough. We have to make some estimates and assumptions. I can't see all the cards. I know. So giving some folks some time to think, and then I would do something like this. I'd have the students turn and talk about what they think their number might be, what, what they might have done. And um, I like how I'm getting a couple answers there. 120, 312, or maybe 240. That's it. What I'm going to say to students is I'm going to offer what are, what are some, I'm going to prompt what are, what are some numbers. And so I've got three or four to work with, right? One thing that I help our teachers recognize is that in a routine, you got to keep things moving and fluid and you have to be responsive. And more importantly, you can't linger. So I'm not going to wait for 500 answers and I'm certainly, I'm not going to go over all of them. I might stop after I record three of them and simply say um, 224, 120, and 240. What do these numbers have in common? Why do you think they are all even? Did you notice that they're three-digit numbers? Why do you think that is? So I'm going to solicit a few uh, numbers from my, from my students and ask them to bat it around. I might ask them to think about, did they have a number that was um, much different than these, right? And then I'm going to change the conversation to, so how did you think about it? Right? What are some things you had to think about to find your solution? And so you might say things like, uh, like, well, two people in each cart, right? So I had to think about two people in each cart. And then I might bat back at my students, what if somebody thought four people in a cart? How would that change their answer? Right? And so again, I'm playing with numbers through pictures. I'm estimating and what have you, right? Um, so what's something else you had to think about? Well, you might have to think about how many carts are on the whole on the whole Ferris wheel, right? And so um, I would then have kiddos talk about how did you figure that out? Did you use um, a quarter of the Ferris wheel? 
right? Did you use a third of a Ferris wheel? I might keep kiddos from trampling over each other, coming up to the board to point at what they did, right? I can facilitate the conversation. But does anybody see a hat? And sometimes as a teacher, I have to be responsive and ready to drop new ideas. And it's possible that none of my students saw a hat. And so I might have to trace that hat for them diagonally across the Ferris wheel. And then I might say, how's a half and a quarter similar? Right? So there's other things that I might have to unpack with students. And it's not so much that I'm looking at getting the answer. I'm trying to engage them in, again, estimation and reasonableness and problem solving and thinking. Um, no matter who you are, you can approach this problem. Now, I recognize this problem might not be perfect for third grade. I'll give you an example of kindergarten in just a moment. This routine is one of our number routines called Picture Perfect. I'll give you the directions in just a second. And then, and I'm sure you've recognized that, you know, in this format, we have to do it slightly a little bit differently than it would be if we we're all in the same room uh, together, right? Another example that we might go through is something like this. So how many books are on the entire bookcase all the way down to the end if that is 15 books? And so this follows a very similar format. Students have an opportunity to think for a few moments, talk to a partner about what their estimates might be, And as a teacher, then I solicit some of those ideas and, and, and pose appropriate questions so that I can expose students to thinking. Right now, some of you might be thinking that there are 15, excuse me, 45 books in that little section. And then some students might say, well, I used 50 because that's a better number to work with for 45. And right away, as a teacher, I win because sometimes 50 is a much better number <laughs> than 45, right? And somebody might say 60, 60, excuse me, and we look at them like they're crazy until they think about, well, I think four boxes could fit in there. Or someone else says 60 because if there's five sections, then I can count by 300s. And so the idea here is that um, in this routine, we want to expose kiddos to ideas about estimation and problem solving and thinking. And I know some of you are like, this will not work with my elementary kiddos just yet. And so what I want to do is share some examples that might, right? And again, this is just one example of a number routine. I'll share another with you before we pivot to problem solving. Maybe this is a better example for you. Actually, this is a perfect one for a lot of our, our first and second graders, maybe even third graders. Are there more or less than 25 brownies on the plate? Mr. Stress, I can't see them all. Yep, but I can't count them. Uh-huh. Well, how would I know? I don't know. Or maybe the question just pivots to about how many brownies are on the plate. What would be a good estimate? How do you know? And again, where we want kiddos to engage, think on their own, right? Share their ideas with the partner, and then um, as a teacher, um, position them to, to lead the conversation. I'm going to give you just a few other examples before, again, I pivot to a different type of number routine, um, and then we go into problem solving. As we know with young students, um, especially elementary students, I mean, really all elementary students, um, that before we get into um, estimating, we might have to do something like this, asking about how many cookies are there, getting some estimates, and then actually doing the counting to compare estimates, right? Um, and I know many of you are familiar with counting jars and things like that, and so this is a similar take on that, but the routine itself can, uh, well, can unpack or unfold in lots of different ways. This routine, as with all others, kiddos in our district come into class, go straight to the carpet, and know that math today is starting with a routine like this or, or one of the other many uh, routines that we use. Some other quick examples real quickly um, could be something like this. I did this just before our system closed for, for the pandemic. Um, I did this with second graders. I asked how many legs are there? What's a number that's too big and a number that's too small? And uh, <laughs> I can't see all the, the legs, and I know. Can I use their heads? Yes. That one doesn't have a head, <laughs> which made me laugh and I explained it was right behind the box. My point is, um, we talked about different ways to count by fours and twos and, and things like that. And what is a good number and a bad number for estimating for this picture? And if you teach kindergarten or there's somebody who does, just asking students to make observations about the box, about how many donuts are there, right? Um, how, what equation could you write uh, to describe the plain donuts and so forth? Again, I have more ideas about this. Happy to share with you offline. If you like, um, it always works and it's fully accessible. What does that mean? Um, you don't have to know the concept of the day to tell me what you notice about the picture. 
and thinking is always something that everyone can do. And I know when I first did this with you, uh, maybe a few moments ago, it didn't feel like it could be a third grade or a first grade routine. But when I changed that question, how many carts are on the whole wheel? All of a sudden that applies to most everybody in elementary school. So realizing this full potential, um, it might end up with something like this. What's a question you can ask about the picture? And so ultimately kiddos see the picture and then they start asking questions that I can decide to investigate, save for another time or um, take stock of. Noticing that I'm trying to wire their brains to be math uh, thinkers and, and, and understanding quantity and number sense. So for example, what fraction of the balloons are red? How many balloons are there all together? How many balloons would it take to get to 20? How long are all the strings if we put it together? How many balloons would it take to fill the screen? I could do this all day. I'm pretty sure you don't want me to. So let me give you one more example of a routine, uh, a different example. And again, I can't give you a complete collection today, um, but this is an example of a number routine um, for a different idea. And that is um, for comparing and contrasting quantities. I should tell you before we do this next routine, um, our routines in our district and the routines that I write about in my work um, are considered, they're not paper pencil activities. Our kids get plenty of that in math. We need to get them opportunities to think, um, to, to estimate, right? And do things of that nature. Um, so before I give you this next routine, I just want you to keep in mind, this is the adult version, and then I'm gonna pivot to the kiddo version, okay? All right. So just think to yourself for a moment, um, this or that, this deal of tennis balls or that deal of tennis balls? Deal A or deal B? Which deal is the better deal? I'll give you a moment to think about that and. We'll come back together in, I don't know, less than 20 seconds. Ah, Todd Trimble, I see your comment. <laughs> Depends, right? Right away, we always think, oh, well, deal B's the way better deal, yes? Unless you're selling them. If you're selling them, then maybe you think about it completely different. And that's something I need you everybody to hear. We discovered in our district, we can't ask kids to think and then be unsatisfied with the way that they think, right? Or be more importantly, that they don't think the way that we want them to. Um, so in this routine, again, you could imagine thinking to yourself, what is the better deal? Um, talking with a partner about what your decision is and how you did it. And I always do this with adults because as adults, we have some uh, strategies that we prefer. And it's really um, a good example of what happens um, when you exchange ideas, right? So maybe some of you thought deal A, again, if I'm buying, was not a, a good deal because you're paying more than a dollar per ball, right? Whereas deal B, you're paying less than a dollar a ball. And I, I need you to keep in mind, I can't simulate all the questions I would ask because our interactions are a little wonky in this, this format. Um, so I might add, then ask, did anybody think about it in a different way? And someone might say, well, I thought about doubling. And I would ask, what did you double? I doubled 18 because 18 is half of 36, so I doubled 18. And then I would ask, so you doubled $15.47, or did you double something else? Something else? And many of my kiddos didn't recognize that you didn't always have to double 15.47, that you could actually double 15 or, or 16. But in the real world, we don't work with exacts like that all the time. And another student may talk about the fact that they have 40, and which point I would just bat that right back into class. What does he mean by 40? Right? And then I'm prepared to ask just one more where I would say to students something like, well, what about now? And as students are thinking about the comparison of these two deals, the next point of my conversation is something along the lines of, how many people are using a different strategy now? Why can't you use double and half this time? Can you use a common factor or something similar? And so this or that is a routine that I've had great success with in our district, where kiddos compare situations using mental math and concepts that they're familiar with. Keep in mind, that that's not a third grade example on your screen right now. So let me show you what something might look like in primary grades or, or other grades. For example, if you had a box of uh, gold coins, first grade, perfect question. Would you rather have box A or box B? And you'd be surprised how many kiddos would say box A because addition makes things bigger. And the same is true for subtraction, making it smaller. And in this case, then that middle row right there, box A is smaller, but maybe not for the reason that all our kids have. And as we go through the grades, it's the same idea, and maybe in second or third grade. In fact, take a look at the bottom row 
of this other example? How many of your third graders, or heck, let's talk about our fifth graders. How many fifth graders will look at the bottom row and know instantly that box A is greater than box B without lining it up, regrouping, and doing a lot of mechanical work without just recognizing that 200 plus 100 is less than 308? Does that make sense? I'm telling you with confidence that many of my kids or our kids in our district didn't always have permission to think. And so routines like this helped us get there. And I'll get to some problem solving in just a moment. Before I do though, I want you to notice one thing. If you go online and Google, would you rather <laughs> math, you come up with examples like this. Would you rather have three tens and two ones or two tens and three ones? We found that kids find this boring as heck, right? They don't really care about tens and ones. We had to put it into context and we had to leverage operations and estimates. Ice cream sandwich? I can wrap my head around that. That's something I want. Would you rather have four plus six or nine plus four when it comes to ice cream sandwiches? And how many of our kiddos would have to actually try to recall their facts or count on their fingers? When other kids would look at that middle row and just say, four is the same in both of them? And so four plus six is going to be less than four plus nine. Does that make sense? And so there's all other examples that you'll get through the recording and the, and the downloading the slides. I can share more if you like, right? Um, the one thing I will note is that I can even use pictures here. Would you rather have this uh, pan of brownies or, or that, that bowl of brownies? And when the student says, oh, I can't have nuts, then they certainly should take the pan of brownies, <laughs> right? But again, this is where I can estimate and compare uh, with actual quantity. So I'm going to shift gears in just a second. I just wanted to give you a taste of what a number routine looks like and what that first five to ten minutes of math really could could be in terms of engaging kids in quantity and reasoning and discussion versus the passive compliance activity of filling out a warm-up or going over homework that somebody might not have had access to the night before. I think you get my point. Oh, and just to be clear, it always works. I don't even need numbers. In kindergarten, this pile of Hershey kisses or that. How do you know? Now, numbers sense routines aren't the only instruction routines that we use in our school system. And so I'm going to pivot now to another big idea that maybe your school system or your school or your classroom struggle with too, and that is problem solving. Um, I'm guessing at least one of you uh, has some kiddos that struggle <laughs> with problem solving. But again, what are the familiar replicable activities that we that we leverage when it comes to problem solving? And are those replicable things really valued or of value? Um, take a look at the screen for a moment. Um, we know that problem solving is hard for elementary students. And frankly, I could just take out the word elementary and it's still a true statement. In fact, I could replace elementary students with people and it's still a true statement, <laughs> is it not? We know that problem solving is not really a procedure. And we know that to be true for lots of reasons, especially when you get into two-step problems. Or if you have a teenager like I do, um, the world is a problem and there's no procedure for solving it, right? Um, so we have a lot of talk about that. But look at that last bullet. Problem solving in general is about making sense, not necessarily keywords, tricks, and tips. You know, if you look at the screen on the lower left-hand side, uh, the 30 apples problem, if you read that problem, you're like, what is going on? And yet kids will give you the answer to that three out of four times. And there's literature to back that up because they're in the act of circling and highlighting and thinking is factored out all together. And labeling the answer is the most important thing for them. If you look on the right side, there were seven jackets uh, left in the playground today and 10 left yesterday. How many jackets were left? Left means subtract. But to solve that problem, you have to add. And so we do things because we pursue answers and unfortunately don't arm kids with opportunities or routines uh, for, for, for thinking. So I want to go over two routines with you today um, for problem solving. Actually, I'm just going to do the top two with you right now. Um, numberless word problems and um, KWS. I'll get to the KWS in a second. We're going to start with numberless word problems. And the intention of those is to focus on context and meaning without quantity. So we do these routinely with our students. And we do those as a routine before we start to work with the problem. Because one of the things we know is that when you can't make sense, when, when you can't solve a problem or you're not sure what to do, the best thing to do is what is it, what is it, what's it getting at or what's it about, right? How do I retell it and so forth? So, um, so let's take a look. 
This first thing is called a numberless word problem, a routine. I don't know who the author is. Uh, we, we acquired it in our district some time ago and uh, use it in most of our classrooms. So a teacher will pose something like this. Travis has some gum he wants to share with his friend. And keep in mind, all of our routines leverage, I think, pair share type activity. What do you notice? What do you wonder? So kiddos have an opportunity to write down some ideas about what they notice or, and some things that they wonder. They, um, they might just talk to each other. Not everything has to be a written activity, as you know. Right? And so then the teacher has a conversation about what do you notice and wonder. Um, so Travis has some gum. He wants to share it. I wonder how many pieces he has or what flavor it is or how many friends does he have. Right? And so we can bring all those ideas to, to the forefront. Then the teacher gives a little bit more information. If Travis and his friends split the gum equally, how many pieces will they each get? So kiddos had a chance to ask their own questions, but now I'm trying to, um, you know, move them towards a very specific question, per se. So we know that they're going to share it equally. What do you need to know? And so kids think about what are the things that I need to know and how would I split it equally? Does it have to be division? Maybe not. Right, and so kids work on that part of the routine for a few moments, and then it becomes this, the actual problem, the reveal, so to speak. Oh, now we know the exact number of pieces of gum and how many friends. If he's going to split it equally, how many pieces will they get? So what do you want to do now? And so this type of routine is designed to, how do I put it, wire brains, wire the brains to think. And so that when I come across a problem cold, I, I have some type of strategy for going after it because I've rehearsed it time and time and time and time again. And I don't have to rely on tricks or steps or other things that might be very faulty. I'm going to pivot and share another routine with you for working with forward problems. If, well, first, if you don't like that version, um, but also because one routine doesn't get it done. Maybe many of you are familiar with number talk, so, which is a fantastic number routine. Um, but doing it for, you know, every day for 180 days you you need burnout. Your teacher does too. I think you got my point. Not to mention that I might need other strategies. So here's another routine for you that uh, that my colleagues and I wrote about uh, well, recently. Um, you're probably familiar with the KWL, right? And so this is a KWS where students come across problems um, and the routine is they routinely write down what do they know about the problem, uh, what they're trying to find out in the problem and how might they solve the problem. So you can read the problem, the story of 13 tennis balls and uh, on the shelf, 13 cans of tennis balls, excuse me, each can has three balls in it. How many tennis balls does the store have? So one way to routinely attack the problem is using this KWS. Now keep in mind, um, as adults, we have been trained very well to pull out the math and pull out the math question. And uh, we had to untrain some of our teachers and more importantly, avoid fully training our kiddos let me show you an example of what I mean by that. Student work, problem you just saw. Three balls, 13 cans. Tennis is a sport, balls are fuzzy, balls are yellow. What the heck is that? And in fact, if you look at the red arrows, they identify the math that we want kiddos to pull out in a problem, but we also encourage students to pull out context and other things. So. For example, tennis is a sport, the balls are fuzzy and the ball is yellow. Um, why does that matter? Um, well, because some of our kids have never played tennis before. They, they actually play a lot of basketball. And the idea of a ball coming in a can is bananas, right? And more importantly, um, teacher says, okay, Jimmy, you don't know what to do. Why don't you draw a picture? Jimmy looks at her and says, what does that even look like? Right? And so sometimes we say, well, kiddos couldn't read the problem. No, they didn't actually make sense of the context because it was completely foreign to who they are as a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, or what have you. Look at the middle row, or the middle column, excuse me. How many balls? Well, that is the question. Are there more balls at the back of the store? Brilliant question. Keep in mind that how many times have you gone to the store and you wanted something and it wasn't there, so you asked somebody if there were more in the back, right? Well, it's hard to solve this problem if you don't know if there are any more balls in the back of the store. And so we encourage our students to write down all kinds of things now we want to see the math appear in this routine or in this routine. And again, it doesn't have to be a written document. The teacher can record for the class or um, what have you. We're just trying to create a routine that is familiar and a structure to use. And take a look on the right side real quickly. Um, we see different representations. And so we've leveraged this in many of our schools that you have to complete this type of organizer 
this type of routine before somebody will sign off on you going after the answer. Try to slow folks down, kids down to think about um, problems. So listen, I don't have a lot of time with you left. Uh, we took a brief look at number routines and um, these were two routines for problem solving. I know many of us um, face challenges with students um, who are emerging bilinguals um, that have great potential and um, we haven't been able to reach them fully yet. And so I wanna get into some language routines with you, but before I do, um, I also wanna argue that most primary kids are language, <laughs> emerging <laughs> linguists themselves, right? So I, I would argue that some of these routines are good for, for everybody. Um, but before I do, just a couple notes. Mathematical understanding and language competence, they develop together. And when students participate in routines, of the ones that I'm gonna share with you, but routines in general, they become agents of their own understanding and doing. Um, they develop linguistic sense making. And through successive supportive experiences, not just these math ideas, but the language as a whole um, expands and grows. And lastly, routines are an opportunity for scaffolding access to content. And um, I don't know that we always recognize that, right? Um, that the routine can be the scaffold as opposed to doing some other modification that may water down the mathematics. So along those lines, let me share two with you quickly and then you know, give you an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, so first, um, this first routine is called Three Reads. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. You'll also start to see that, you know, you can imagine a giant Venn diagram that these routines start to blur lines and that they have different purposes. So Three Reads is a routine, for a language routine, a reasoning routine. Um, first read is to read the problem and retell what it's about. The second read is to read the problem. Now that you've retold it, well, what's the actual question? And then the last read is to read for the important information. It's a great process or routine uh, when encountering problems as well for learning about language. So take a look, Jackson's new pack of Legos has had 235 blocks and Jackson had 4,350 Lego blocks altogether. How many Lego blocks did Jackson have before his new pack? And keep in mind that for a lot of kiddos, um, you know, this is this is an addition problem. Um, they don't know, they, they can't subtract because the bigger number is not first. There's there's a lot of things that muddy their, their approach here, right? We know that this problem structures can be challenging. You know that all routines are to be owned by teachers and they can be modified for the maturity of their students. This is a version of three reads where we understand the context, analyze the problem, and then brainstorm representations or such, right? And so a very similar process. I'll talk more about the similarities and the need for that in our school buildings in just a moment. But before I do, I, I wanna share just a different routine. I think we can wrap our heads around three reads pretty quickly. Um, this different routine is called collect and display. And keeping in mind that routines are not just for kids and students, but, but also for our teachers. And so collective display is a cool routine where the teacher circulates while students are engaged in the problem and talking, right? And the teacher records words and phrases such as added Legos. Now he has more Legos, 235 plus something. And, and the teacher records these ideas and drops them or puts them on the, on the screen or whiteboard or whatever it might be, right? And then when the kids or the student, the class comes back together to talk about the problem, the teacher highlights the things that she observed while students were working so that she can amplify the mathematics and the language and the representations. And simply, it's just a routine that's really powerful when you see it live. But in defense of many of my teachers, many of us weren't trained to leverage routines in math. So my time uh, is about to be up. I'm gonna have some questions to answer with you um, or answer for you, hopefully. Um, but first I wanna share a couple of things. Um, and before I do, well, let me just do that first. Let me share, uh, where can you learn more routines? Um, so if you're looking for number of routines, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't have a shameless plug in here. Um, I have worked with daily math routines, uh, Jumpstart Math. It's that colorful book in the upper right-hand corner. Um, which provides teachers with routines to use in the classrooms for, for developing number sense. Our district is an open source curriculum. You could use that link there to find a collection of routines by grade level that you could assimilate into your instruction. Number talks are fantastic. I have nothing to do with them, um, <laughs> full disclosure. But again, um, maybe not the only routine I do. And then again, uh, 
Stenhouse and NZTM provide other number routines as well. So then if you look down around where it says routines for reasoning by Heinemann, and those next two bullet points, those are routines for problem solving and thinking. Although I could argue that my number sense routines do the same thing, sure, right? Um, but again, it's good to have a wealth of resources to think about what we want to lift up and what we want to leverage uh, with our colleagues. The next to last bullet is um, principles for design of mathematics curricula. Da, 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 da. It's that white thing, uh, that white paper on the lower right hand corner out of Stanford University's graduate school. Um, and that is about language routines. Um, and we have just started really unpacking that with our teachers and have had some early success with that um, so that we can, can really come after math instruction from number sense, problem solving, and, and language. Um, and lastly, um, a nod to our sponsors for today, Reveal Math, uh, a new series from McGraw Hill, will feature the three types of routines that, that I shared with you um, today. But you can get a jump start on all of those things by taking a look at some of these resources. Um, and before we take some of your questions, I know as a leader, um, you know, you often have to think about what are the actions that I need to take? Um, what are some things I might ask myself as I prepare for or leveraging routines. My guess is there's some, in some level of practice in, in all of our buildings, right? Um, I think the challenge for us is finding what are those that we need to feature consistently, number one. I think that we need to have whole group agreements about the routines that we use, thinking that if a kid, a student is exposed to a routine in the protocol early in the year, right? Then that individual not only is trained for the rest of the year, but also for the rest of their experience while they're in my building if that makes sense to you. And, and though maybe, um, you know, my language changes subtly, um, the, the grander perspective of the routine remains the same. Um, and it also helps my teachers then be consistent with how they do business. So think to yourselves as you leave today, um, between number sense, problem solving, and language acquisition in mathematics, what is the greatest challenge for your students? Where do you struggle the most? And then I'm going to be a jerk. Be, be clear, it's not a question I'm asking you, I'm asking myself. So what are you doing about it? I often listen to the challenges that I had and, you know, oh my gosh, my kids don't have number sense, my kids don't have number sense, until finally I realized it was because I wasn't doing something, right? Other questions that we have to ask are, where would you start, right? Do you start with a few routines and grow that? Do you focus on just number sense? What support do you and your teachers need? understanding how these work and so forth, among others. And last but not least, um, how do you look for it? So in the process of training our 2000 elementary teachers and our 40 principals that I work with almost daily, um, we had to think about training it well means we see it every day. So how do we look for it? How do we take stock of it? And how do we talk about it? So on that note, I wanna pivot back um, Kurt and happy to take any questions that anybody has. Great. Thank you so much, John. Uh, really interesting. You've given us a, a lot to think about here. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, and yes, well, just one more time before we get to the questions. Uh, John's been so kind as to uh, make his email and his Twitter handle available here in the slides. And uh, do note that uh, the five is highlighted on purpose there. That's right. <laughs> There's a gentleman in Germany that, uh, with the same name that gets a lot of his email, so make sure you include that five uh, in the email uh, if you have questions later on. But uh, for now, if you do have qu uh, questions for John, now is your chance. A uh, couple quick reminders. Uh, we did get uh, getting some questions here saying, great presentation, we'll, uh, we'll be making the recording available. And yes, uh, everyone will be getting a follow-up email with links to this recording, as well as the slides. Uh, so don't worry about that. You can keep an eye out for that later. And uh, also, uh, if you do have a question, just uh, don't forget, uh, we're getting some in the chat window. If you would go ahead and put questions in the Q&A, the bottom right-hand corner there, uh, puts it into a, a queue, it makes it more organized for us. Uh, so thanks in advance for your uh, understanding there. Uh, John, first question for you. Um, you know, we, we talked a lot about uh, 
what you highlighted, of course, instructional strategies and uh, talked about a lot of things that teachers can do. If you're an instructional leader or an administrator, how important is it to implement or take this kind of approach at a school or district level? That yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. yeah, it's a great question. It's essential. Um, we had to make sure that we had a whole school, whole district agreement. We had to recognize why these things were important. And in my role, we had to create a, uh, not necessarily a workflow, but a roadmap for not just the training, but the implementation and the support that we're going to give teachers along the way. And it was also critical, and I love that, again, we have so many admins here today. It was critical that our principals and assistant principals were aware of the information, too, and understood how these things worked so that they could support in the moment, um, but that they could also set realistic goals for our teachers and, and be flexible in responding. Uh, to them. So, great question. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, another, uh, well, interesting mm -hmm. one uh, similarly asking about uh, the role of parents. Uh, do you communicate with or support parents on the importance of these routines? Is there a role for parents to support these types of routines at home? Yeah, certainly. Well, we always want our parents to be aware of what our math program looks like, right? Um, we try to help them understand the big goals of, of mental math and thinking and reasoning and things like that. Um, we bake in some of the um, more accessible routines when we do parent nights and things like that. Um, we don't necessarily leverage them for them parents on oh, and for number routines at home. But we do try to make sure we communicate the different instructional routines, such as like the problem solving routines that, that mom and dad might use or families might use at, at home. Um, so we want to we want to bring them in the loop. We want them to understand the value and the importance and why math doesn't look like 1984 anymore. Um, <laughs> and, and more importantly, what we're doing about it and how we can partner in moving that kiddo forward. Okay, sure. Uh, getting some more questions here from our audience. Thanks uh, for your uh, participation here. Um, another one says, uh, as a school leader, how do you begin implementing these strategies? you have advice uh, on yeah, where to start? Yeah, I do. Don't make some of the mistakes I've made. Uh, no, I'm teasing, right? So, um, you know, setting, setting um, a roadmap for where you want to go and what you want to be doing, right? Um, bringing teachers in to collaborate on the, the, the routines um, that we're going to do and what the agreements were. For example, when we first unleashed the number routines, we said, teacher, I trust you, choose when you want to do it during the day, beginning, middle, end of class. And many ran out of time and didn't get a chance to do them. So then we came back together and talked about it needs to be on the front end of math class, right? And so we came to the agreement that's what it was going to be. Um, you know, we in some buildings we had to say, okay, the goal is we're going to do these this year, three days a week, and then we're going to adjust that to four days or five days, depending, and we're going to learn from it, right? Um, so helping teachers understand the why, because I think most every teacher wants to do what's best for their, I know every teacher wants to do what's best for their kiddos, um, but understanding why. And the other thing that teachers want to know is that, you know, am I going, is this effort worthwhile? And more importantly, um, I can't take a little more things. So how is this doable? And so just for the school leader to know, I'm um, framing this and this actually makes your job easier because once you train your kiddo in these seven routines, your 10 minutes of math are set. Your first 10 minutes of math are set for the entire school year, right? Um, your go-to when a kiddo struggles with a problem is set because you're going to use these three problem solving routines. So um, that's a really short answer, but hopefully it helps. Uh, to get some ideas. Yeah, sure, sure. And um, some related questions is asking about challenges. Uh, what, what was the greatest obstacle you encountered uh, when you were trying to do this? Is it some of those things that you said there, the mindset? Yeah, yeah I think so. And again, um, reluctance as a whole, right? And I think as leaders, we face that most with most everything we do. Um, so reluctance, and again, that's why um, framing the why and making sure we have supports in place and, and reasonable goals for our teachers to meet as well was, was important. Um, outside of the schoolhouse, there wasn't, the parents weren't too reluctant to these ideas. I know 10 years later, especially with numbers, since we get a lot of feedback saying that uh, my kid has is such a great math thinker today. So I think that there are benefits there. But, um, but back to the obstacle question. Um, you know, reluctance and, and fear of the unknown. Um, so it was really important to make sure we had the right things in place to move forward. Um, you know, we made some missteps and, and learned from them. Right. Oh, right. oh sorry. I see it. Oh, you can ask. Sorry. I saw a really good question pop up. 
Uh, yeah, which one here? <laughs> um, yeah, which one? They're all awesome, right? Uh, so the question about how do we support these strategies with special education students, and I'm going to blow that even further to ELL students among others, right? Um, so we we are working hard with our ESOL teachers and our special educators to bring them into the planning conversation to um, work with what are some tools to provide greater accessibility to the routines. Um, but also keeping in mind that it's critical for all students to have access to these routines. I'm, I'm going to pivot from special education to ESOL because it's the example that's popping into my head at the moment. Um, but, but but for example, um, we learned that think pair share needed instead of the partners, it needed to become triads because the ELL student needed access to the conversation, but may not be able to participate fully. And so um, we had to modify some of our strategies in those ways. And again, I, I know that doesn't speak to the question of special education. It's just the one that popped into my head. Um, but we had to work on different ways to, um, you know, to, to go after the routine so that we increased accessibility uh, for students, including providing tools and, and what have you. Okay. Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, more questions here. Well, uh, several about uh, how to get started. Um, and one question here says, once everyone is on board, so kind of talking about what you were discussing earlier, uh, what are there any routines you would recommend focusing on first? So once you get... Oh, great question. Going, yeah. Yeah, great question. So... Um, Probably a good question to shoot me into offline because I can give you a list of them more specifically. Uh, it depends a little bit by grade level, but I shared the picture. And again, I'm going to just stick with number sense for right now. Um, but there's probably a scope and sequence for each of the routines or each of the different types. Um, but back back to number sense, we want to like so those picture routines and some other things like that where you know you don't have to have any special um, math knowledge to to observe a picture per se, right? And so those are some of the routines that we wanna start early in the year or some types of would you rather type eliminated routines where kids are comparing and contrasting. Uh, again, greater accessibility there, all kiddos can participate. And then as the year progresses and my students evolve as mathematicians, then I might start to use more that are estimation based, right? Or I might use more routines that are uh, grounded in decomposition of number um, or something like that. So, so the pathways may be unique to a specific classroom, um, but the routines themselves play well in all grades, which reminds me, I did see a note in there about sixth or seventh grade. Yeah, we do routines in middle school as well. Um, and, and I've written about number of sense routines uh, for middle school grades too. I just wanted that question. Sure, yeah, I, I was gonna ask that about, you know, you focused on the elementary grades. Um, how does this uh, relate to those later grades after that school, et cetera? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, and again, I think this comes down to district agreements and how um, we we build a cohesive experience for our students, um, not just within the building, within a grade, but but across grades, across buildings. So along those lines, um, you know, training kids in many of these routines and then like the number or the type of number may change from a whole number to a decimal to to a negative number or something like that, but the protocol for thinking and reasoning, the way that I've helped wire your brain or helped you think about things, um, that doesn't necessarily change. Right now, again, because of schedules and other challenges that we have in middle schools, among other places, we might have to think more flexibly about how we implement routines or, or when we leverage them, but, but they certainly uh, can thrive. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, a follow-up question uh, asking what about high school grades? Do you think these kind of strategies could work there? Um, so shameless plug, yes. I, there's a high school <laughs> number since book as well. I, and again, I, I'm laughing only because I'm a jerk. Um, no, in all seriousness, yes. Um, and I'm actually really laughing because I have a high schooler who it seems like the further she is away from elementary school, the less she can remember how to think. And I sound like a jerk there, sorry. But um, my point is um, high school students do need opportunities to practice with these types of um, routines and rehearsals. And, you know, um, sometimes they don't know where to start with the problem and they haven't had enough opportunity to practice. What do I know? What do I need to find out? Um, and, you know, and so we result resort with mnemonics and all these other tricks when really we just need to give them a chance to think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it works better yet a protocol for thinking. Maybe that's a better way to 
right? Talk about it. Sorry for interrupting you. No, that's fine. And and that's a good lead into this this next one. Uh, someone just asking about uh, what do you think about applying some of this to other subject areas like science and English, uh, utilizing instructional routines. Um, seems like an interesting question. You know, a lot of this is developing mathematical thinking and how to think in those terms. Maybe could that be applied, you know, to think scientifically uh, and to think philosophically and logically in other areas? I, I couldn't see why not. Now, again, my expertise or focus is in, in mathematics, but to the point or to the question, absolutely, right? Thinking is not, uh, you know, relegated to one field. Um, so the routines might look different, um, but I do think that, like, for example, in language arts, we could develop routines for how do I make sense of vocabulary, right? Um, how do I routinize? That's not a word, but pretend it is. Um, things like Freire models and, and other graphic organizers. So, you know, I don't have the, the recording sheet, but I do have a mind map for how I can process information and, 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 and make sense of it. So the answer to that question, yeah, I think it could work everywhere. In fact, uh, yeah. 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 Okay, sorry. No, it's an interesting question. It'd be uh, really interesting to, to see uh, differences and similarities. And Sounds like somebody just got a new project that they need to work on. <laughs> there you go, a new book. Uh, okay, well, uh, I think we've hit just about all of our questions here. Thanks so much uh, to everyone in our audience for uh, for your participation, and we're just about out of time here, so I'll, uh, I'll wrap things up on behalf of all of us here at District Administration. I'd like to thank our presenter, John, once again. Thanks so much for sharing your time and expertise with us. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. I'm sure you're busy there. Uh, and thanks again to our sponsor, McGraw-Hill, for their generous support of our webinar here today. And once again, to our audience, thank you so much for joining us. I do hope you found this presentation informative and useful to you. Producing webinars like this one is just part of our mission here at DA to inform school district leaders like you about the latest news and trends and ideas in K-12 leadership and management. You'll find more coverage about issues such as the ones we discussed here in the pages of our print magazine as well as our digital edition and website, through additional web seminars like this one, and through our various email newsletters which you can sign up for uh, right from our website. And as I mentioned before, uh, for those of you who would like to share the content of this presentation with your colleagues or if you want to go back over it at your own pace, um, you can access it archive will be uh, stored at the URL on your screen here. Uh, and everyone, once again, will be receiving a follow-up email with links to the archive recording, as well as the slides. So you can go back over it uh, and download those. So don't worry about that. Keep an eye out for that. Uh, you should be getting that uh, tomorrow. So uh, that is it uh, for today's event, once again. I'm Kurt Isley Durley for District Administration on behalf of everyone here at DA. Thanks so much for joining us. Please stay safe and take care of yourselves. Goodbye, everyone, and we'll see you soon.